permeability effects. While a full stop from a physical barrier causes intense turbulence in the air and frost pockets, allowing some of the winds to permeate through the windbreak is the most beneficial and influential arrangement possible. It pushes air upward, condenses the air as well as the moisture in that air which leads to increased precipitation. Warm winds entering a windbreak or forest cool and slow, allowing the wind vapor they carry to fall and condense on the surfaces around them. When frozen precipitation falls, it can pile up and make windbreaks more effective. Permeability of windbreaks can also affect how much and what kinds of organic matter and nutrients accumulate as slowing winds drop whatever silt, seeds, sand, or organic matter they carry. Therefore, permeability affects how fast topsoils and organic matter content increase. Hurricanes, Cyclones, and Typhoons Still air near the equator causes violent updrafts of air over warm sections of ocean, creating the large, classic hurricane spiral which is drawn to land. The direction spirals turn in depends on the hemisphere. Northern, counterclockwise. Southern, clockwise. Tornadoes are vortices of air that occur when hot and cold air meet, usually during a thunderstorm, and can be very localized, dangerous, and brief. Tornadoes can happen inland and are not dependent on a temperature threshold. Cyclones occur in the Pacific Ocean, and though less violent, focused, and intense, they are similar in behavior, destructive nature, and function to tornadoes. In certain areas, intense cyclones are reclassified as typhoons. Though not water-related, firestorms look and behave similarly to a cyclone. Dry winds and fire combine into strong vortices as intense heat pulls upward, while dry cold air pulls downward to fill in the vacuum, creating a tight spiral of air. They are literally like tornadoes of fire. Landscape effects. Continental effects. The third most powerful effect on climate after temperature and rainfall is the effect caused by the distance of sight is from the ocean or large body of water. Large bodies of water have a mitigating effect on localized atmosphere, lessening the cold of winter and the heat of summer. The inverse is also true. The further you are away from bodies of water, the deeper the summer heat and winter cold. We observe this readily in the United States Midwest. Altitudinal effects. As we rise in altitude, the relative climate changes, even though our distance from the equator does not. Islands with high altitudes can cover a diverse range of climate-specific species. However, it is not an exact analog to similar areas. At higher elevations, air is more rarefied, the radiation higher, the precipitation higher, the temperature changes between day and night more drastic, and the air pressure lower than their lowland equivalents further from the equator. Snow cover can create a warm layer above the snow during the day in sunlight by reflection. Inversely, it can create a very cold layer of air at night just above it, even though beneath the snow layer, a steady temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius is maintained. Snow's high albedo reflects radiation efficiently while compounds the solar energy that plants, land, and animals encounter. Slopes away from the sun also have a pseudo-altitudinal or latitudinal effect to varying degrees, like a deep crevasse that never sees the sun. But again, it is not quite a perfect analog. The inverse is also true. Wide valleys facing the solar path can trap heat, be drier, and generate strong winds as the warm air drafts rise. This creates a large microclimate that would mimic a less favorably structured valley closer to the equator. Cumulus clouds can be created this way in moist temperate climates. As you travel closer to the equator, the clouds become more profuse until they remain clinging to the mountaintops and ridges. Latitudinal effects. Subpolar latitudes have long day length during summer, which compensates for their overall lack of sunlight during the winter. Photosynthesis is curtailed by lack of light and heat during cold months. Certain subpolar latitudes are fed by warm air and water currents that make for superb growing seasons, creating their own large-scale microclimates. Norway, Scotland, Ireland, and Alaska are examples. This is the reason for Alaska's giant garden vegetables and not Alaska's soil composition. 
The equatorial tropics suffer from too much light, and this inhibits growth as much as lack of light or heat does. Shade can raise yields significantly in these areas. Bright sunlight can inhibit growth above 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. When light intensity gets high enough, Carbon dioxide must be provided to raise yields through the use of animals in greenhouses, mushroom cultivation, or composting. All create CO2. Using tropical plants in equatorial zones is ideal since they can handle low CO2 levels and heavy light saturation. This is another reason why temperate farming techniques being applied in the tropics have been a historical failure and still are in many areas today. Biomass accumulates seasonally in the high altitudes each summer, and it accumulates continuously and inefficiently in the equatorial regions. This also accounts for the temperate climate's deep soils in comparison to the relatively shallow soils of the tropics. The riot of growth in the tropics belies the scant fertility in the soils. The carbon cycle. Above all other elements, carbon is essential. It is the building block for all life, providing structure for plants and animals, as well as fuel for reactions and food for all life. It is found in plants, animals, fossil fuels, the earth, the soils, microbiology, and in the air. Photosynthesis is literally synthesizing the sunlight, water, and air into usable energy for plant growth by forming carbohydrates, sugars, out of CO2 and H2O. Herbivores eat that carbonaceous plant material for their energy and structure, while carnivores feed upon herbivores for their intake. Omnivores eat both herbivores and plants for energy. The carbon source for all these forms of life comes from the carbon cycle. Life and all biological activity is composed of complex carbon-based molecules. Soil organic matter is all biological activity in the soil, plus the remains of all previous biological activity in the soil. Every single molecule in every bit of soil organic matter anywhere is made of carbon atoms. That's Alan Yeoman, Priority 1, 2005. When grasses dry out to brittle straw, they've left behind nearly pure carbon. 97% of a corn plant's physical mass comes from atmospheric CO2. When plants and animals decompose, they release carbon into the atmosphere and into the soil. The soil life releases and consumes carbon in all its interactions as well, forming soil structure and feeding multi-trophic levels. Animals, fungi, and plants at night take in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere as part of respiration. Oxidation or burning of any carbonaceous material releases carbon dioxide. It is a process of oxidizing the carbon and changing it from a solid to a gas form. When soils are tilled, soil life is oxidized, mechanically destroyed, and dried out by being exposed to the air. Agriculture's most damning contribution to climate change is the release of carbon held in the soil, primarily from deforestation and land clearing. This is Eric Tonsmeyer, The Carbon Farming Solution, 2016. Carbon sequestration is soil building. Since carbon is the primary component of soil organic matter, it is the best indicator of the current carbon levels in the soil. Carbon can be sequestered or trapped in plants, soils, and in soil life. Forests are large pools of sequestered atmospheric carbon. Their structures are made out of carbon, and while they lightly exhale carbon at night, they vigorously exhale oxygen all day, releasing 10 times the amount of oxygen they take in. A third of worldwide fungal biomass is carbon, 5 gigatons and mycorrhizal fungi are responsible for sequestering nearly a third of the carbon in soils, forming the soil structure ideal for growing plants. Encouraging mycorrhizal fungal growth as a form of atmospheric carbon sequestration has not been adequately studied and easily comprises a greater potential than all vegetative pathways, which alone presents incredible potential. A field of corn captures about 400 times as much carbon as there is annual increase of man-made atmospheric CO2 in the entire column of air above that field from the ground to the upper reaches of the atmosphere. However, most of the biomass carbon 
thus photosynthesized, is respired back into the atmosphere. Nonetheless, the capacity of vegetation to photosynthesize CO2 can be used as a strategy to create a positive carbon budget, while also enhancing ecosystem services. This is from Rattan Lal, Managing Soils and Ecosystems for Mitigating Anthropogenic Carbon Emissions and Advancing Global Food Security, Bioscience 2010. Professor Rattan Lal has said that we can sequester all the excess atmospheric carbon in global soils within 50 years. But with a combination of reforestation, wetland, riparian, watershed restoration, and ocean restoration, we can speed that up. There have been claims that it can occur in as little as 10 years time. And while that might be mathematically true, it hasn't proven true in testing and modeling for scale. We can regrow forests and restore almost all the desertified land within that time frame, but sequestering all the atmospheric carbon is different and likely will require time while the forests mature to fully achieve balance and mitigate the global water cycle. It is sometimes claimed that perennial grasses that are strategically grazed by high density herds can sequester more carbon, build more soil, than a mature forest can. Which may be true in some cases like polyphase farm, but in natural untended systems, forests almost always sequester more carbon. Some types of grasslands have more soil organic carbon than some types of forests, but this is the exception, not the rule. This comes from Eric Tonsmeyer, The Carbon Farming Solution, 2016. Algae and kelp forests can sequester carbon at least 10 times the rate that perennial grasses and trees can, but they need our help. The ocean waters have already absorbed half the carbon that has been released into the atmosphere. And in addition, the U.S. West Coast kelp forests are over 90% reduced since the last El Nino. That is why there are concerns over acidification, though the oceans are far from truly acidic. Even slight acidification or ocean warming is enough to disrupt entire ecologies. The coral reefs are bleaching and shellfish are struggling to fully develop their shells. It is just like a shade plant being moved into full sun. It burns, or in this case, bleaches. As they bleach, they release more carbon. Carbon levels in the atmosphere must be drawn down if we are to reverse climate change and all its connected imbalances. Carbon dioxide is the largest contributor to climate change, though it is only one of several greenhouse gases, most notably methane CH4 and nitrous oxide NOx. These gases are like greenhouse plastic covering the earth, trapping and focusing the energy of the sun. The soil is the best place to take back this excess carbon. Though we must also restore our forests, grasslands, oceans, and biodiversity, the soils are the foundation for all those systems. Restoring our soils will sequester carbon as it supports and generates other carbon sequestration processes. While this is hopeful, we have to move quickly because we are exponentially releasing more carbon each passing year. It takes time for sequestration to occur in new forest systems, though it accelerates after the first five to 10 years of establishment. No-till agriculture and holistic management grazing reverse carbon emitting practices while sequestering carbon in the soil. Though this also takes time, the soils we have required millions of years to develop. There is also a limit to how much soils can sequester. And it also should be noted, sequestration rates slow as they approach carbon capacity. It will take time and an immense collaborative effort. Some studies estimate it will take 60 to 100 years to return atmospheric CO2 rates to 1750, while others forecast a much quicker recovery given the many examples of rapid soil building on small intensive sites. Nonetheless, it is still a limited window of opportunity that will require unprecedented effort and requires farms to become atmospheric carbon sinks instead of sources. We have to phase out fossil fuel usage for these natural carbon sequestration methods to be effective. We have to start growing our fuels, fibers, foods, and resources, regeneratively and locally, while putting limits on consumption. Soil, having an organic matter content of only 5%, holds over 35 times as much carbon as that causing global warming. That's why soil fertility concepts are so important and why increasing the fertility levels of our soils can fix global warming. 
prairie soils, such as those in the United States that once had up to 20% organic matter and have been gradually reduced to levels often below 5%, can also be restored to their original richness. They can rebound rapidly back to those 20% levels. Recreating the richness of the soils of the American prairies could almost on its own normalize world carbon dioxide levels. This is from Alan Yeoman's Priority One, 2005. The math is constantly changing as we release more CO2, CH4, and NOx into the atmosphere. And while there is still a debate over these processes and their conditions, it is clear that the soils are depleted of organic matter. The primeval forests are gone. And desertification continues to displace vegetation and contribute to the mass extinction of global biodiversity. The soil, forests, animals, and plants are the long-term storages of carbon for our planet. By dumping all the carbon out from those storages nearly all at once into the atmosphere, we've set ourselves up for a progressively hotter climate. We can reverse it by building soils, planting forests, reversing desertification, and embracing carbon sequestering farming methods, rewilding our landscapes, and restoring and protecting the oceans and wetlands. It is entirely possible currently, but we must act quickly. To fix global warming, we need to put that 0.081 inches, 2.1 millimeters of carbon back into the 8.5 of the earth we actively control. That quantity of carbon is the same as in a foot of soil with just 1.6% organic matter content. There is more than that in most desert soils. This is from Alan Yeomans, Priority One, 2005.